Everybody, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday, a lectionary podcast from St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm John Kennedy. And so today we have the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. And the big question is, is it a successful triumphal entry or not? Here's the text. It's Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will enter it. You will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. I mean, Peter, you're the geography guy, but one little thing that I read that I found super interesting is that Jesus is, of course, if you read earlier in Mark, coming from Jericho. Jericho is the lowest city Mm -hmm. in that part of the world, maybe like one of the lowest cities anywhere. It's like 800 feet below sea level. And of course, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem along with all these other pilgrims for the Passover. And Jerusalem is 3,000 feet above, according to what I read. And so you have this epic journey upwards through the wilderness. So the journey itself is a symbol for Passover, and Passover is uh, one of the defining symbols for what is going on here, this this time of God's liberation and deliverance um, of his people. Uh, so I just thought that was a very interesting sort of visual uh, uh, thing to have in mind for approaching the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like an epic journey. Yeah, and another geographical perspective too is that Jesus up to this point has been sort of taking Galilee by storm and signs and you know he's been doing his exorcisms and healings and you know taking on uh local kind of community division I think and now he's going to the center and he's going to take on the temple you know establishment in Jerusalem and so we're traveling today on Palm Sunday with Jesus from the margins to the center and um, and that's even more profound that he's going from the lowest, mm-hmm. you know, point and climbing up to this massive undertaking. Yeah, in all the Gospels, geography is theology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is in this case, uh, it's interesting how, how you started us off with the, the road from Jericho, which is the road that uh, Wadi Kelt looks out over for those of you who are pilgrims. It's the place where the Good Samaritan takes place. And uh, Beth Page and Bethany are at the top of the Mount of Olives. But the Mount of Olives itself is uh, incredibly symbolic in what Jesus is doing in the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is, it's, it's really a hill, right? It's 300 feet mm-hmm. uh, higher than Jerusalem. And, uh, and there was great expectation that the Messiah would come down the Mount of Olives and into, uh, into Jerusalem. And in uh, 586, there was uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and Ezekiel saw a vision that in the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity that the, the, the spirit of God in the temple left the temple and went out through the east gate and up into the, went up and resided at the top of the Mount of Olives. And it was believed that the Messiah would then come back down the Mount of Olives mm-hmm. and go through the east gate. And mm-hmm. uh, the east gate itself is, has been um, bricked up and bricked over since the, I think it's the 1500s, I think 1541. I was reading a little bit about that this morning because the East Gate is super, super interesting. Uh, and the steps up to the East Gate are still there. And those are the steps I know in another pod I talked about 
I, I talked with, oh, Neil Armstrong saying that his walking up those steps to the East Gate, knowing that Jesus had walked up and down those steps when he was going back and forth to Bethany and when he was uh, on the donkey, that these steps were bigger than the steps he took on the moon. So oh, wow. this, this geography stuff is a big, big deal. It doesn't just happen in a place. It happens in a place that is completely ripe with symbolism. Mm. Yeah, and maybe over, over discussed, but never um, the last very important, I think, is just the East West face off we have here that you know I have a, a book a, an author I like named Brian Zand who was sort of a former Pentecostal and um, now I, I would say kind of progressive evangelical or so but he has a church and he writes a lot of books and in one of them called Postcards from Babylon he talks mm, about traveling with his wife all over uh, you know it's all over the world really but especially in any big city they notice these statues, you know, memorial statues. And he says, there's always some gu- dude on a horse, you know, <laughs> and, and we spend so much, uh, Mark spends so much time, you know, for such a brief gospel, he spends a lot of time here talking, setting up the commandeering of this donkey and how it's going to take place and what it's for and what they're going to say. And, and then he gets on it. You know, it's, it's pretty significant because he wouldn't spend words like this in this particular gospel. And so I think what's going on is that, you know, Jesus is subverting this war horse image. And, you know, even in the Jewish history, um, you know, he's got the Maccabean uh, conquerors, sort of guerrilla ca- commanders trying to ride in and take back the temple and the the capital and um they're always riding in armed like kings you know and the people in mark that are there and also the first readers of mark would know these historical markers and so we've got jesus doing just this very subversive thing of commandeering a donkey or a colt i guess we get a colt in mark but you know not a war horse and on the other side of jerusalem from the west it, it's not said, but if you know Pilate were to enter or so on the uh, to Jerusalem, he would come in from the other end on a, his steed with fanfare and armed and full of fanfare. You know, so I think Jesus throughout this whole scene and his whole trip into Jerusalem is a deliberate plan of action to subvert the the established order, and he's also. He's also subverting the, the messianic triumphalism. You know, you said, is this a successful triumphal entry? I think, of, of anything, if anything, it's a very ironic triumph. And he's trying to subvert all the angles of conquest and militarism. You know, he's a, he's a nonviolent, he comes in unarmed, decisively unarmed. You know, and, and at the end, he just looks around in the temple. And he will come back and turn over tables, but it's not... A military action. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really compelling to me that that Jesus approaches Jerusalem in this way that he both embraces the messianic symbolism, um, but also Elizabeth, as you're saying, powerfully subverts it. It's it's really really amazing. Um, yeah, and I, I think you're right to say that the details of the donkey are significant, even though it seems like a strange sort of aside. Uh, to me, it also is is one of these details that suggests the historicity, like who would make up a little exchange like this, <laughs> like Jesus sends the two disciples ahead to go find the, the donkey, and then if anybody asks you, hey, why are you, why are you taking this donkey? You say, well, the Lord needs it. <laughs> I'm 100% with you on the historicity yeah. front. You yeah. know, I mean, I never paid any attention to the idea that, that Mark was taking a Peter's Petrine material and turning it into the gospel. But the more I've been studying it, the more I'm like, yes, I see this. I see this because this has all these little, little Mm -hmm. exchanges Mm -hmm. that uh, have eyewitness like things. And it says there um, that, that such a throwaway line about, he asked two people to go and get this donkey. I mean, perhaps, perhaps Peter was one of the two. He said, Mm -hmm. go get the donkey from, and on the donkey front, you know, back to all of the, um, symbolism in the donkey mm. i you know the 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 subverting on peaceful uh 
coming in peace, Jesus, was the thing I had learned. But I, I actually, it, I think, yes, fully, 100%. But I think we miss it completely if there isn't a full one other 100% here, which is Jesus is that kings of Israel do ride donkeys. Yes, right, And that, right. Uh, that begins right from the, the book of Genesis at the end mm-hmm. of the book of the patriarchal blessing, Jacob's blessing of Judah, where he says, you know, you're going to arrive on a donkey, all the, the Zechariah stuff on a donkey that, that so after Solomon became king, after after David, he rode on a donkey. That, that I think the shocking thing here, is, with reference to Mark's gospel, isn't that Jesus is subverting things. He's a subverter. Uh, but that Jesus is owning his yeah. messianic thing. Yeah. The messianic secret comes out of the bag, and they're expecting the Messiah to come in on a donkey, and he's embracing it. So mm-hmm. I think that's the shocker, is that finally in Mark's gospel, Jesus is like, going to do it. And, and it has to be the donkey that's never been ridden because kings rode donkeys and horses that were never ridden. And all those little details are messianic details. And so mm. Jesus is finally on board with the <clears throat> thing that we as readers have known all along. Mm. I, I mean, that's to me what I find somewhat shocking about this. Sure. I think both things can be true yeah, at the I same time. Both 100% and, true. You know, I think, yeah. I think Jesus is pulling on all the references here and finding a, a way to usher in something brand new and completely upend the establishment because it has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And he's anti-military. I mean, the Zechariah prophecy that we get in Matthew's version of this, which is just implied in Mark, talks about, uh, you know, it's, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious as he humble, or it's humble, it could be translated differently, and riding on a donkey, a colt, as you said, the foal of a donkey. But the point is, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem, the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. Mm. And, you know, he, this word praus, or humble, and it's, it can be translated nonviolent, yeah, you know, 100%. and his, he's completely expressing an anti-militaristic entry and that hasn't been the precedent with even jewish kings oh no you know they've been warriors for god or for their people and jesus is using the donkey that's you know zechariah is talking about with this image of ending ending the violence and Mm. having a different kind of reign so i don't i think that is consistent throughout all of mark's story and you know after this passage he goes and confronts the temple's exploitations and i mean you preached beautifully about the about the johannine version of that story in mark i think it's it's really pointing up the exploitation of the system of the system against the poor and we have the the widow in the temple later in the next chapter we have all of the scribes and temple authorities confronting jesus you know how do you where's, where's your authority from and you know they're just it's like this litany this like drumbeat of and and They trap him with Caesar, you know, paying taxes to Caesar, the divorce conundrum. You know, they just have this whole list of things. They take Jesus on all in a row really quick in Mark following this entry. So it's a setup to be, you know, you're not going to get me on these things because my kingdom doesn't have anything to do with these systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a question that raises for me is is whether Jesus is like anti-military or just like non-military or non-militant. Because um, if for me, all this raises the question of what did Jesus intend to do, especially when compared with what actually happened? Um, because if Jesus intended to like end violence, he failed <laughs> like really badly, right? Because 2024, the year of our Lord, right? I mean... We, we know what history has been. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of see Jesus as establishing um, as limited and perhaps problematic as, as, it, as terming it this way might be. It might be also be helpful, like a spiritual kingdom that sort of exists in the midst of this world that is just like, as, as Leonard Cohen called it, a, a dismal catastrophe and veil of tears um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that it just exists in it. It doesn't <coughs> presume to end the violence, but it, it, it sets up a, a sort of a counter witness, a counter way of being um, in the midst. Um, and, and I think the, the question that, and this is getting us maybe a bit too far out of the passage, but, but that Jesus gets later about the tax, 
I think to me sort of indicates his attitude. He's not anti paying taxes to Caesar. He's just like, whatever. That's not, that's not actually what matters. Um, you know, as, as you'll say, and he'll say in John, my kingdom is not from this world uh, or not of this world. Um, and that, that gets to the question of, of was, the, was this a success for Jesus or not? You know, um, it's, it's a really interesting thing, you know, what, what victory and failure look like for, for Jesus uh, because it's, it's not at all like what we measure things by. But, but nonetheless, you know, we are still here, 2024, talking about Jesus. And uh, so somehow his way has um, endured. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking about this last night. Um, so I was listening to a Leonard Cohen song. You can tell I'm, I'm very into Leonard Cohen right now. But it, it's a very strange song. And I was like, I, I've always thought it was strange. It's called First We Take Manhattan. And I was like, is this song just like from the perspective of a terrorist? So I looked it up and Leonard Cohen was like, yep, this, song, this is a terrorist song. Oh, wow. <laughs> He's like, I always find terrorists interesting. And they're, you know, I don't like what they do, but there's something about their commitment um, and a certain sort of purity, <clears throat> which sounds kind of crazy. But, but he went on to, to cite this poem um, that said, like, you know, you know, your terrorists might, you know, blow some things up or whatever, but, but, you know, our terrorists are like, you know, Jesus and Einstein and Freud, and like the world is still quaking from them, and uh, we're still quaking from Jesus in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm tempted to jump in, but I've already, of course, you can. Gave you should. No, this is your, this is your, this is your <laughs> I have passion. very strong feelings Go about for it. this. This is your passion. I mean, I, I, th- I think that if we're going to measure success of Jesus by, you know, how many, uh, how many goals he achieved. He, he failed miserably, he died without friends. You know, they ran away from him, especially in Mark's gospel. But I think that he didn't come to do it all. You know, he came to kind of usher in a way and usher in the complete um, uh, gateway. You know, to in, in Mark especially, it's the tearing open of heaven at, at both the beginning and the end where the presence of God is is unequivocally with us and walking with us. And it's not Jesus who fails. It's, it's the people in his wake. You know, Annie Dillard said, it's a pity that so quickly on the heels of Christ came the Christians, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we, we really don't get it. And, and Christianity in the very beginning was so countercultural, so riveting. It was life and death for the people who adopted the way. And um, it turned the Roman empire on his heels, you know, to the point where Constantine adopted Christianity, but then it was sort of co-opted. But I think the challenge for modern Christianity is something that Zand says that I referenced at the beginning that, you know, how radical is, is and counter Christian is countercultural is Christianity. Now, you know, he goes as far as to suggest we are like a religious endorsement of Americanism. You know, it's not, or, you know, militarism, let's say. But I, I don't think it resembles much of what Jesus set out to reveal. So, I mean, I feel like Jesus came to uh, suffer the violence that we inflict in order to show us what we're doing. And we still really can't see it. And until we see it, there's no hope for the world. Because, honestly, I think that is the only hope for the world, is to become nonviolent people. Otherwise, you know, it will continue as it is in that veil of tears. Well, certainly, uh, thank you for that, both of you, your question and Elizabeth, your passionate answer. There's no doubt, uh, the the question of the scholars, uh, question over was Jesus, was this a triumphal entry or not? uh, I, I think that had to do not with whether or not Jesus's mission was successful, but it was, did his followers understand who he was? Did anybody understand who he was? That that was, I think, what scholars are disagreeing over. Uh, was and 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 it's that funny ending, the, the kind of anticlimactic ending. Where uh, then he, then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It's an incredibly anticlimactic ending, too, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, given that yeah. in, in all the gospels or in the in the others in the synoptic gospels. Jesus is setting his chin, his face to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is coming to Jerusalem. No, really coming to the temple. It's not the Jerusalem proper. It's the temple proper. It's such a big deal. And then he gets there, and it's like, ah, we kind of got in kind of late, and you know, didn't quite have the energy, and just sort of headed out. This is the only time in the Synoptic Gospels that we have a reference to how Jesus might have been staying with Mary and Martha and Lazarus out in Bethany. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the things I really like about that ending here is is. 
John, where you were before, which is it sort of points to my mind toward the historicity of it, uh, which is the possibility that Jesus got there and it was late and he went back out. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it, it wasn't his time. It wasn't mm-hmm. the right hour for such mm-hmm. a thing. Also say that when you want to look at the historicity of these things, uh, it, it's a little confusing because, as you know, in uh, Luke's, I mean, Ma- Mark, bleh, in Mark's gospel, there's a lot of great books written about the last week. Mark lays it out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, uh, but in John's gospel, it seems that uh, it's likely that the triumphal entry was in the fall, that Jesus spent four months in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and that the the branches, the the leaves, the leafy branches were there for the feast of the tabernacles. And noting, of course, that there. I mean, those of you who've been to the Holy Land know that there's a lot of palm trees down in Jericho. But there's not, you know, that 2,800 feet you were talking about at the start. There's no palm trees up there. I mean, mm-hmm. they have leafy branches, but they're not palm trees. And that it, you know, the story as we receive it is. Uh, potentially moved around for theological points, but doesn't actually represent literally Jesus's exact m- movements. But mm-hmm. I do think that the kind of uh, anticlimactic ending is kind of rings true to me. It doesn't make a great movie mm-hmm. scene, but I mm-hmm. think it might make a true mm-hmm. Jesus scene. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's only in the memories of his disciples through the lens of the resurrection that they really rethink everything and none of the actual movements are fixed in stone you know no one's being a documentary historian in these gospels they're all telling a story to make a point to encourage a people to further the movement to make disciples you know to to argue or to you know make apology or you know apologia for their faith and I, I think it doesn't matter. We can clearly see in the first century, historicity wasn't something that was required in writing a, a gospel. Well, I think there's two different things here. I mean, there are there are there are uh, views of historicity in the in the gospels all over the place, but oh, there's yeah. also the question of whether or not the complete whole narrative is, you know, as is, as you're referring to beginning to end. I I, mm-hmm. I agree with you. I'm not saying yeah. they're fiction. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying that it doesn't matter to put it on a timeline that yeah, yeah, rang exactly. correct. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I don't know where to pick up. Maybe just a word about what Palm Sunday does for us and, you know, sets us up for Holy Week. I think, unless you had a place to go, I, I think it's really, this passage in our service on Sunday gets read quickly. We, we march around the church with our palm branches singing um, the great yeah, hymn. Do it. Hit it. Hit the hymn? No, no. Hit the, oh, hit the, hit I won't your, do that to you. Know, you. Hit, you just uh, give a word. Yeah, so that we, we take our procession with our palm branches and then we uh, sit down and hear the whole reading of the Passion. So by the time we're 30 or 20 minutes into the service, we have put this aside and we d- dive deep into the Passion of Christ and read read that story. So um, I, I think it's very worth pausing like we're doing today to talk about this entry into Jerusalem because this is the beginning of Holy Week. It's the moment where we turn our attention towards these important steps towards the cross on Friday and towards Easter Sunday. And, you know, we're entering the city with Jesus. And um, so it happens fast and we don't talk about it so much on Sunday. So uh, that's, I just wanted to put in a, a little liturgical framework around it. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, as we wrap it up here, uh, I'm going to put in another little uh, scriptural uh, context here, which is to say the, an enormous percentage of the scriptures are the last week of Jesus' life. Mm-hmm. This, this text today uh, kicks off the final third of, of Mark's gospel, which is the la- one third of the gospel is the last week. And we know in John's gospel that uh, half of the gospel uh, is the last week. John, you've been talking about the book of signs and the book of glory. And mm-hmm. so, uh, folks, this podcast is to kick off your Holy Week, and we hope that uh, you'll be able to enter into the journey with Jesus uh, now that we're in Jerusalem, the, the journey through Holy Week. We love it when you subscribe and when you give us a call, when you pass it on. And I want you also to know that we're going to be doing podcasts on Maundy Thursday and a podcast on Good Friday and a podcast on Easter so that we too can walk the journey. Uh, so as we're done here, you guys, any of the final word before we say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye? No, I'm good. Okay, peace be with you and uh, and blessed Holy Week. Oh, 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 o